Welcome to Word on the Block, the series that takes a deeper dive into blockchain and the emerging technologies that shape our world at the intersection of business, politics, and economy. I'm Forecast News Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. Welcome to the show. Well, as we've watched blockchain grow and develop in China, it's also with curiosity to see how the authoritarian state is really dealing with public and permissionless blockchain protocols. We dive now into Conflux because we've recently reported on Forecast News that Conflux has been able to win not one but two state endorsements, one from Shanghai and one from Hunan province. And they've been able to do what no blockchain protocol has been able to do thus far. In fact, many would dream to have the kind of endorsements that Conflux has achieved. So how did they do it? Well, uh, right now, why don't we ask our next guest? He is uh, Eden Dhaliwal. Welcome, Eden, Global Managing Director of Conflux. Welcome to the show. Thank you. All right, so you are talking to us from Toronto? That's right, Toronto, Canada. All right, but Conflux is a very Chinese-friendly, a Chinese uh, based almost uh, with Shanghai and Hunan uh, backed endorsements. How does a guy from Toronto uh, and how does Conflux uh, with its reach deep into China, how does this all work? Yes, yeah, a good question. So um, yes, it's true that uh, Conflux is a um, China originated um, um, public network. Um, but you know, um, we've got uh, significant ties to Toronto in the sense that uh, one of our founders is actually a professor at the University of Toronto, and we've have, have a number of advisors from the University of Toronto. And so, um, I've been based personally based out of Toronto for the last few years, um, and um, you know, prior to joining Conflux, I was actually working with uh, Outlier Ventures and building their crypto practice. And uh, a lot of that work involved uh, working with academia, economists, computer scientists. And um, over time, it brought me to the University of Toronto where I caught up with Fan Long, one of the founders, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, a prof at the U of T. And um, you know, we started talking about Conflux Network and I quickly realized that Conflux is a bit of a sleeping giant and um, uh, I was very intrigued by um, their march towards mainnet. And I took the challenge of, you know, helping introduce Conflux to the world. So we're announcing um, Open DeFi. It's something that we're super excited about. Um, it's a global project initiated by Conflux. Um, we're bringing together basically the top crypto finance um, players in China, in Asia, uh, that consists of Binance, Sequoia Capital, Block Power Capital, Antelope, and DeForce. Um, this project is also state supported through the Shanghai Science and Technology Committee. And we'll be announcing in the next two to three weeks some more established Western DeFi uh, partners for this project. And so uh, the goals of Open DeFi. Um, are firstly to improve security and liquidity across geographies, across applications, across networks, um, including from CFI to DeFi. Uh, and then secondly, to drive innovation across um, both the Western and Asian markets. And so Conflux is uniquely positioned to sort of drive this innovation within the DeFi ecosystem and we're really excited to be, you know, pushing this initiative. All right, we know what DeFi is. What is CFI? Is that China Finance? What's the C for? Uh, centralized Finance. Centralized Finance. Okay, got it. Centralized Finance. And that's really interesting in terms of interoperability um, between centralized and decentralized finance. How are you going to achieve that? Well, we've developed three, three tracks um, that are kind of going to enable this um, you know, this, this, this initiative that is going to 
um, you know, we hope create bridges uh, and more liquidity within the eco DeFi ecosystem. So these three tracks uh, involve risk management, uh, incubation and innovation, and then you know, uh, bringing everybody together to develop new liquidity strategies. So we think the combination of these three, um, these three tracks and these three goals are going to enable and facilitate assets to move more freely between centralized and decentralized, um, you know, systems. You know, and it's, it's um, very interesting to see how that actually will work in China. This is notoriously a very authoritarian with, with very strict capital controls. Uh, the People's uh, Bank of China, you know, a very... Uh, controlling central bank with very um, specific protocols when it comes to how much money people can keep in this, uh, bring in and out of China. How do you meet those regulatory and political uh, uh, parameters? Well, I don't think we're, we're really, you know, uh, to be quite frank, I don't think we're really too concerned about the sort of the regulatory um, issues around DeFi at the moment. I think what we're really trying to do is introduce the, the, the new innovation and financial engineering around DeFi to the China market. And I think well, what's going to happen over time, and, and you know, again, we're uniquely situated Conflux um, to kind of be this advocate um, leading the charge for decentralized and open um, applications and marketplaces. We want to introduce some of these new innovations so that, um, th you know, they'll have their place in the future of decentralized finance in China. And so the, the average Chinese citizen uh, post this initiative, what are they going to be able to experience uh, when it comes to being able to access uh, DeFi, to access what yield farming, to access, you know, all of these other things that uh, allow them to, um, you know, move in and out of, of uh, DeFi? Right. So, you know, we want to enable, like I said, um, um, uh, financial innovation, financial engineering that's going to develop new products, new services for, for, the, for the China market. And so um, right now uh, we have a market uh, that's sort of uh, still using traditional uh, quant trading and order book models. And we want to start to enable things like bonding curves, automated market making to kind of provide the greater liquidity, um, you know, even um, uh, the, the movement of, of, of assets through stable coins and wrapped assets. So we just want to essentially introduce these products to, to the market, firstly, by introducing uh, and initiating uh, innovation and incubation, and then through, um, um, you know, providing a, a, um, uh, a sandbox for users to kind of safely use these products, um, you know, that have been tested uh, for security and um, for, for economic uh, design. Uh, we're really trying to just foster a risk-managed approach that that can provide the market some assurances that you know they're not going to be you know um uh they're not going to lose their money let's put it that way yeah yeah i mean it's it's a, a lot of people are probably scratching their heads right now isn't cryptocurrency banned in china so uh you know on one hand cryptocurrency is banned in china and then on this hand it seems like they are building out open DeFi, open access to DeFi. Right. How, how did these two things jive? I think, I mean, when, when you think about cryptocurrency being banned in China, it's really uh, stems from, you know, the level of, um, um, I, I hate to say it, but just how ICOs and token sales were abused, uh, you know, for a period of time. And, um, 
and how the speculative market drove a lot of scams. And so um, what the government really wants is compliant fundraises. And I don't think, I wouldn't go so far as to say that the cryptocurrency is completely outlawed. You know, we've done a regulatory compliant fundraise and, um, you know, we do have a cryptocurrency and, um, you know, we'll be able to sort of operate in, in the China market. I think, uh, I would say the market as a whole um, and the government uh, understands that there's a tremendous amount of innovation and value that could be created from cryptocurrency. And I think as long as the approaches are regulatory compliant and safe, um, you know, I think they, to tell you the truth, I think they're open to um, experimenting, uh, seeing that experimentation and, and, and understanding, you know, uh, how, how they, we can sort of introduce some of this new value to the market. And so again, for Conflux, you know, we are sort of the advocates of public permissionless blockchains and you know we have this unique role of sort of facilitating this introduction to not just public blockchains but also these decentralized uh, marketplaces applications and you know in this case uh, DeFi uh, offerings. Is it fair to say that Conflex has the ear of of high level officials in China and you're able to shape the 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 collaboration and the cooperation as China moves towards uh, what it hopes to be a block base, uh, blockchain-based future. I think um, I think we have a very good relationship with the government, um, where um, they they understand that at at the heart of of um, uh, at the heart of our project are a group of computer scientists that are trying to you know deliver. Um, an open network for open commerce, create a bridge that uh, basically global markets could use to tap into, um, you know, open commerce, decentralized uh, um, uh, applications in China. And so um, there's, a, there's quite a bit of credibility and trust that we've developed with the government. Um, I think, you know, our project being born out of Xinhua University, which is sort of the top, you know, um, university in China. Uh, our project, um, you know, having been led by Turing Award winner, Dr. Andy Yao, you know, brings a lot of credibility. And then again, I think, you know, going a regulatory compliant route, you know, similar to Blockstack in the US, um, we built a lot of trust as well. So the fact that we have been, um, you know, at our core computer scientists that want to introduce this technology and sort of enable commerce, open commerce for China, I think has resonated really well for the, for, you know, for, you know, for the government. And, you know, it's, it, it's the reason why we're able to have conversations with them and, and talk about, um, um, you know, how we could push forward uh, blockchain as a technology. And really being, being those, uh, uh, I guess, bringing, bringing the understanding to a greater level. Um, but it does also come in a time where uh, China is at the crosshairs of some geopolitical storms. Yeah. You know, the U.S.-China uh, trade tensions that have gone beyond trade, quite frankly, now has bled into technology. Huawei uh, with a semiconductor ban. We have TikTok at the crosshairs. We have Tencent and WeChat. Um, you know, all, all of these China technology firms right. are now being targeted. Right. Do you have concerns about that as you, as you try to, to move forward with innovation? You know, I think, um, you know, we prefer to, um, to, to, just kind of demonstrate value and um, almost take a proof is in the pudding type of approach, right? We're, we, we have built a, a breakthrough, uh, highly scalable, developer-friendly 
public permissionless blockchain infrastructure. And we have a beachhead into China that's going to put not just transactions on the network, but transactions of real value. Uh, we think that um, we, we, we can kind of um, walk the walk in terms of, um, you know, creating a, a, a public network that's going to be a public network for the world, not just China. And so we, I think we understand that there's, you know, especially with in, in, in the blockchain crypto space that the Western um, viewpoints are highly ideological, but I think, you know, there are advantages um, that we have in, in being very pragmatic about our adoption that sort of um, integrates some top down strategies for adoption that will help us, um, you know, help us put a lot of value on this network. And then I think, what will eventually happen is that we will be that gateway. We will be this value pool that Western projects, you know, businesses outside of China can tap into um, to, to um, you know, conduct uh, uh, transactions, to uh, exchange assets, you know, to build marketplaces. So I think, you know, our approach is that we're going to build our network we have a very um, clear path to operate in China. It means that not only can we operate freely, but we can actually operate with a great deal of speed. And you know, we have a tremendous amount of adoption that's going on right now. We have you know, 50,000 people in our community. We, we've just got the second state endorsement, as you mentioned. And you know, we've, we are onboarding, um, you know, um, quite a few government projects, I think that will get announced over time. So there's a lot of transactions, a lot of value that's going to be built on this network. And I think, you know, for those that might be sort of skeptical because we are, you know, sort of China originated, I think there's going to be a certain point in time where it'll be somewhat unavoidable where, you know, we, we really do have a valuable network and a public permissionless network which does fit the ideo ideologies of, of Western markets, and I think we'll win them over. All right, decentralization is a key theme. Um, let's talk about uh, BSN, the Blockchain Service Network. Uh, there's, uh, there's some real clear developments there, and it has uh, captured the imagination and the attention of the West, to be sure. Um, and there's, there's uh, two forks. So one uh, is the local version, Right. Uh, domestic, internal to China. And the rules are very different than the BSN International, which is uh, much more right. um, permissionless and collaborative. The BSN Local asks for very specific things. Um, know your customer is, is very, very clear. Everybody needs to get state approval before they participate, which if you think about it in the broader scheme of things, really flies in the face of the philosophy of yeah. decentralization and permissionless, uh, and so how do you how do you how do you make sure that you you know that that you balance that? In, on one hand, you're you're permissionless, you're decentralized, but internally in China, you have to play very strictly to to the rules of the game. Well, I think uh, two things. One is um, BSN is. Uh, I would say is oriented towards enterprise. And um, as a result, you know, um, you know consortia, uh, you know, there's been a long history of enterprise taking a consortia approach to, to, to build sort of and, and take a, you know, uh, private blockchain um, uh, strategy, especially in China. And so BSN is facilitating a lot of that. They're sort of creating this marketplace where people can, can go in and they can use a variety of tools and, um, uh, you know, have some choices around blockchains to kind of facilitate that. Um, you know, the public, they have this, this other sort of uh, set of offerings that are sort of on the, on the public blockchain side of things. And, um, you know, to the extent that, that uh, um, you know, the market can kind of utilize that, I think it remains to be seen. In, in our case, you know, I mean, 
I don't think there's any ambiguity, right? With BSN, I think there's some ambiguity. Um, I think there's a lot of value with BSN, as I said, on the enterprise side. But in our case, um, you know, what we're doing is we are demonstrating the value of public blockchains to the government. And so, the, you know, uh, part of that is, um, you know, onboarding government use cases and continuing to build this this case for public networks. And we're fairly, you know, our strategy is very much oriented around building up, continuing to build a case for more regulatory um, breakthroughs. And so um, we've kind of got that inside track to introduce public blockchains to make that case. We're very confident that as time goes on, as we are able to demonstrate more and more successes, um, we, we're going to get more regulatory breakthroughs and there's just going to be a lot more um, uh, applications, marketplaces built on the Conflux public network. We heard very early on as uh, China was developing its CBDC, now called DCEP, the digital currency, electronic payment, essentially the digital RMB, that Conflux was, uh, you know, in the early days, uh, advising and, uh, you know, participating in educating uh, what we are now seeing um, going into its seventh year. Uh, right. You know, uh, China started a, a couple of years back. They've, they've got a little bit of a, a head start. What, where are we with DCEP? Um, what can you tell us about it? And, and you know, what is it shaping up to be, especially with, with the kind of architecture that, that you've helped advise on? Yeah, to be <laughs> to be honest, I wish I could say more. I don't really have a ton of information on it. I do know that you know we we remain a a sort of trusted advisor, especially on the technical end of how to implement um, and execute um, um, you know the 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 digital currency. Um, I think. Um, it, you know, I think we're, we're of course very supportive and, you know, it, it remains to be seen, you know, uh, how it's going to be rolled out. Got it. All right. Let's, let's, um, let's talk about <laughs> your very unique role, uh, uh, that Conflux sits very rare bird's eye view. You've got right. offices in North America, in Africa and in China, right. um, as you kind of take a look at, at what we're watching emerge, which is essentially a digital race between sovereign nations. What, what's your perspective as to who's more, um, who's got the, the ecosystem, the, the, I guess the Petri dish in place that supports the kind of developments that, that we're seeing in this space? Well, I think, um, you know, firstly, I, I don't believe the, the, the Web3 space is a, is a winner-take-all space. I don't think you're going to see like sort of, you know, um, uh, as many outcomes um, like, you know, Facebook and Google that own their categories. I, I think uh, the Web3 space and, and when it comes to decentralized technologies, I think what's unique is that each network builds its own, its own community, has its own set of values, uh, has its own set of value propositions, and um, you know, are able to create a set of economics and governance that can sort of you know, uh, keep those constituents um, uh, motivated. And so um, obviously Ethereum, I think, is an extraordinary network with tremendous community um, and, you know, their communities is, is, is almost their moat, to tell you the truth. Um, and I think, you know, the, when it comes to um, sort of leading um, uh, the experimentation in this space, I mean, that, that network, uh, those, those developers are certainly on the for forefront. Um, but then, you know, I also see uh, networks like Celo that, um, are focused on you know emerging markets, Africa, and um, and and they are really thinking about where can we you know take uh, where can we make an impact right like 
here today for people who need it? Like how can we put blockchain uh, and decentralized applications to work where, where it actually has meaningful impact? And so, um, you know, from a conflict standpoint, you know, we kind of incorporate both of those visions, right? Like mm. we, in China, we're developing our own sort of um, developer community. Um, we're doing it in a, a, with a different strategy, you know, hacker culture and developer archetypes are very different in China. And so, you know, we're taking a kind of a top down approach where um, uh, we've integrated with universities and um, are, are, are kind of introducing our technology to developers in a very um, structured, um, almost programmatic way. And, um, and we're building uh, our community and facilitating innovation through things like Open DeFi uh, in China. And then likewise, you know, um, we are, are very interested in um, taking our technology and uh, making a, 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 a real impact in places like Africa where we could facilitate things like payments and other sort of financial services. And so we're very focused on, you know, creating um, not just value for, you know, on the network uh, for our community, but also, you know, uh, creating, uh, developing some social impact where we can kind of, you know, um, address not just um, those that, are, that want to opt out of, you know, our banking systems, but, uh, those that uh, are under and and un unbanked and underbanked. You know, in and, and bringing it back to Open DeFi project in China, it, it's very interesting to understand that you do have uh, uh, the the China endorsements behind you. What's the what's the political perspective on Open DeFi in China? You got a lot of huge state owned banks. Uh, so right. does this also communicate that even the banks themselves in China are thinking about starting to think about uh, crypto and DeFi? I think, you know, like, like all banks all around the world, I think, um, you know, just the pace of innovation and what's happening, the growth, you know, for example, with, I think we're now at 9 billion, um, uh, nine billion dollars locked up in in DeFi uh, as of today. Um, I think, you know, like all banks, um, I think it they you just absolutely have to be on top of what's going on in this space. What are the new innovations? Because there certainly are offerings coming out of DeFi that are are uh, you know I think are innovations that uh, the banks will, the banks and regulators over time will want to closely consider, right? And so everything from lending, uh, credit in lending to how uh, exchanges are working, you know, with, with automated market makers to, you know, using bonding curves to do, you know, um, fundraising. I think these are all new innovations that are gonna be around for a very long time and I think at some point will be institutionalized. And so, um, you know, like, like the government, the banking system, I think is looking for some, um, almost some handholding uh, mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, you know, having someone introduce them, introduce them to some of these DeFi innovations. And so that's, that's kind of our role. And especially yeah. you know, Shanghai being one of, one of the states that's, endorsed us and also being a fine, you know, the financial center in China. That's really interesting. You mentioned uh, bond raising. I mean, local governments and local provinces across China, this is one of their most integral uh, uh, functions, um, you know, to doing the, the business of running a, a province. Um, could potentially these endorsements from Hunan in, in Shanghai, could we be seeing some DeFi projects even at a state level? You know, I'd like to I'd like to say that uh, anything is possible, right? Mm. Um, uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that in a way that that's actually very exciting. 
I mean, if you think about it, public permissionless blockchain is is a very contra can be a very controversial um, subject for the the Chinese government, and yet um, you know we we have had very sort of productive and educational uh, conversations in introducing the merits of 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 you know decentralization, and so um, I think there's um, there's a lot of growth um, that will come um, uh, in 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 the DeFi space. I think a lot of that growth will be enabled by not just the relationships that Conflux has, but also the initiatives that we're putting together around you know incubation, um, and, and some of that incubation is actually you know formalized. Uh, for example, uh, our recent uh, endorsement with the Hunan government, we we are launching an innovation center that that will have an incubation center. Uh, likewise, our Shanghai facility that was funded by um, the Shanghai state government also has an incubation mandate. So we certainly expect to introduce uh, DeFi projects um, through those through those programs. That is uh, extraordinary to watch. And Eden, I could talk to you. <laughs> I could probably talk to you more at length, um, but we'll save it for the next time. I can't sure. wait to really um, here at Forecast News. W w you know, we we sit. We feel like we sit on the cusp of of this innovation story as, in Asia um, as we watch China very closely. So it'll be very interesting to see how this develops. And uh, we will tap you again. We will tap you again. And I, I hope you do come back on the show and, and we'll talk some more. Well, thank, thank you for having me, Angie. Absolutely. Eden, thank you for joining us. And thank you, uh, the rest of you watching along, uh, for joining us on this latest episode of Word on the Block. I'm Forecast News Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. Until the next time. I really like that one. I hope you did too. That's what we do at Forecast News. I'm Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. Click like, comment, and don't forget to subscribe. And here's the next one.